Hey everyone, on this episode of Coding with Kate, we are going to be talking about CPT versus PCS, specifically with a VP shunt or a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which is what we talked about in the previous CPT video where I attempted to find out how to code that, and it was... It was just weird. I didn't like the process and I didn't like the language that they used to describe a VP shunt. And in the back of my head, I was already translating into PCS and it was very hard to not use PCS terms. And in this episode, I wanted to basically discuss the differences and why the form of PCS is easier better, more complete than CPT. So in the previous video, I'll have a link in the description so you can go watch that. We were given the procedure of creation of a VP shunt. And I think it's odd to use the word creation to describe the insertion or placement of a shunt because you aren't creating the shunt out of body parts found within the, the body. So why would you use creation when it's already a device that is being inserted, implanted, etc.? So the differences between CPT and PCS is CPT just uses essentially the language, almost verbatim in most cases, what the doctors use and what if doctors use different terms to describe the same procedure? Then how are you going to search it? It's going to make it more difficult. Whereas in PCS, there is more uniformity in the way we describe procedures. Yes, you have to translate the op report, what the doctor says, into PCS language, but it takes an understanding of anatomy and physiology and understanding each root operation or objective of the procedure to translate it and that's actually very simple once you learn all of that information. So with anatomy and physiology, if you are currently in a coding program and haven't taken an anatomy and physiology course or if you are in one currently, this will be right up your alley because we are going to be talking about the physiology of the central nervous system, specifically for a VP shunt. So I'm going to be going somewhat in depth on how the cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, flows through the brain and why a VP shunt is needed, how it works, and what word or root operation PCS uses to define that. It's going to be a lot of fun. In PCS, we describe placement, insertion, implantation of a VP shunt or a device as a bypass. Now you're probably thinking, Kate, why is it a bypass? It has nothing to do with the heart. But in PCS, the root operation or objective of the procedure of bypass is altering the route of passage of the contents of a tubular body part. So the objective of a bypass is to take the contents, fluids, solids, gases, altering its normal pathway within the body to a different pathway in the body, usually because there is some blockage or some traumatic injury that caused a complete and total stoppage of the passage of whatever contents, and it also covers not just of a tubular body part, but the passage of fluids within the body if it has a normal pathway and it's not technically a tubular body part, but it has an actual pathway that it always moves through, altering that pathway, such as what a VP shunt does. So. In the brain, we have cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. 
it doesn't technically go through a tubular body part, but it moves within the spaces of the brain and spinal cord, and it always moves in that pathway no matter what. But if there is a blockage of sorts, we need to figure out how to alter that pathway because there can be severe health risks, or it could even be fatal if there isn't an alternate pathway for that CSF to flow, which is the device of a VP shunt acts like that. Now let's actually go in depth on how the CSF moves so we can understand the VP part of a VP shunt. So looking at our cross section of the brain, we can start to see the anatomy of the brain and where the CSF flows. So in the very center of the brain here, we have our lateral ventricles, which are ventricles essentially are cavities within the brain, so open space that the CSF flows through. And here we have the origin site of where the CSF comes from, so where it's secreted, which is the choroid plexus. There's also choroid plexus right here in the brain stem, which is in the fourth ventricle. So the CSF is secreted from there, and it moves its way down into the third ventricle right here, down again into the fourth ventricle. From here, it works its way around the spinal cord. It can move up behind the cerebellum, and then up in between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater, which are two of the three meninges or layers that encapsulate the brain. It can also go around the spinal cord and then up to the anterior side of the spinal cord and the brain. From here, along the arachnoid mater, there is arachnoid granulations, which are these guys, which is essentially where the CSF then gets absorbed. From there, you can go online and Google the process after it's absorbed and how it works its way through the body. But this whole process of CSF and its flow and the reason for it is very interesting. Originally, it was thought that the CSF was solely for buoyancy because there is this space around the brain and spinal cord and the brain just kind of hovers in there. And in recent years, I'm not sure if it's been in the last decade, but there has been research that has shown that the CSF also provides nutrients to the brain as it's flowing through it, as well as filtering out and disposing of waste products. So essentially, the byproducts of metabolic processes that happen within the brain and the spinal cord. So all of these waste products, byproducts, need to make their way out of the central nervous system, brain spinal cord, to be absorbed into other areas of the body where it can be broken down further and then excreted out of the body or taken out of the body through other processes. If there is a blockage of some kind that is preventing the natural flow of CSF, you can have two things that will happen. One, you will have an accumulation of CSF in any area before the blockage, and that can essentially cause pressure on certain parts of the brain or spinal cord wherever that accumulation will be. So essentially think of a balloon filling up with water in between a tight space. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's going to push and cause pressure on its surrounding sides because there's nowhere else for it to go, so it's going to make room. And if that happens in the brain, you can have brain damage, effects on brain function, and then you can also have an accumulation of waste products that essentially become toxic to the brain because there's no way for your body to then filter out all of those waste products if it can't make it to the arachnoid granulation, so it's just hanging out in whatever section. And that can be fatal if it is not rerouted, and especially with just the accumulation in general of CSF, where it creates pressure on certain parts of the brain. 
that can be very damaging and cause other um, brain damage. So that is why we use a VP shunt to insert it and then a part of the catheter of the VP shunt then reroutes that CSF to a different part of the body to alleviate that pressure and to also help for a different way for the waste products to be reabsorbed into the body so it does not become toxic and fatal. So now that we understand the anatomy of the central nervous system and how CSF flows within that body part, the brain spinal cord, we can talk about how shunt is always connected to bypass. So with a shunt, it is a device that is implanted just below the skin, so in the subcutaneous tissue, and on one end there is a tube or a catheter that goes up and connects into one of the ventricles. On the other end of that device there's another tube or catheter that goes down into the abdomen or peritoneum, so VP ventriculoperitoneal, that's telling us the origin and the end point of the shunt and it creates an alternate pathway for that CSF to flow because usually there's a blockage of sorts that doesn't allow that CSF to continue on its normal pathway to then be absorbed back into the body. We need to alter its route, alter the route of CSF down in the, in the peritoneum where it can then be absorbed by those tissues and that is why we call it a bypass because we are altering its original route to a different route where it will then flow all the time or until the shunt is not needed anymore. That is the objective of the procedure, altering the route. And that is why we use bypass, even within the central nervous system. And yes, there are other procedures in other body systems and body parts that use the same root operation, but remember, PCS, focuses on the objective of the procedure. The objective might be the same regardless of what body part, body system you are in, and that's why we have uniformity in PCS because we know bypass will always be available when that objective is present for a certain procedure. And we know that in each body system that bypass is available, where bypass procedures or bypass-like procedures are available, we will find that root operation table bypass, which will give us all the different body parts that are commonly used in bypass procedures, and then we can fill in the rest of our code, and we don't have to be searching in the index for what terms CPT might be using for this type of procedure, or what body part it is in, and thumbing through pages and pages until we find it. It is all within a table of the body system that we can always go to. And since each character of a PCS code describes and captures a different component of the procedure, it is in one easy place to find. So we don't have to worry about being in the wrong section or being in the wrong list of codes or not being able to find whatever heading we're under, body part procedure, whatever. It's all easily in a table where we can find it. And that's why I like PCS over CBT, especially with this specific procedure. So with bypass, it is a fun root operation to work on and to code for. I will have a link in the description to a previous PCS video where I talk about root operations similar to bypass. And I give a couple of examples of bypass and what that root operation means. We basically touched on all of that, but if you want to know about other root operations that are similar or fall within the same family of bypasses, you can go to that video and learn more about those. And I will hopefully have a PCS bypass procedure video up soon where we go into the book and actually code a procedure and also dissect an op report to figure out what information we need for building that code. Also, comment, 
below if you have any questions. If you agree that this is actually really interesting and you prefer using root operations or objective of the procedure to code, or if you still don't get it and you just have questions, let me know in those comments and I will research the answer if I don't know it already and hopefully I'll help you out. You can subscribe to this channel so you can get notifications on whenever I have videos posted so you're always in the know. Like the video if you liked it. <laughs> That's always nice to do. And I will see you all later.